Hey, thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. We have prayed that you'd be blessed by it. Uh, we want you to know too, we believe that this is really supplemental uh, to your, your experience in the life of a local church. But if you're here in the Dallas area, we hope you'll come and join us and be with us for worship. We pray this blesses your life and you're drawn closer to Christ as a result of this message. Hey, good morning. It's great to see you. Go ahead and grab your Bible and turn to uh, Genesis 11. Why don't you do that? Hey, um, I am curious. How many of you are reading through the Bible with us? Raise your hand. Okay, and others of you who are not, um, repent! <laughs> and uh, ha, you can join us. You can repent. You can still repent and join us. Uh, this video came, came, through, came to us this week and really helping us understand. There's videos along the way that help us, different themes, different books and such. And it's been awesome. And so I'm going to draw from this video is why we wanted you to see it. Get everybody on the same page because one of the things that you learn when you start to read the Bible is that it feels a lot like um, a Star Wars movie. If you're like me, any Star Wars geeks, fans, yes. Okay, so some of you, a lot of you know then that the first episode of Star Wars is The Phantom Menace, which came out in 99, right? Then you got episode two and three. Then you've got episode four, which was actually New Hope that came out in, anybody? 1977. Come on. Um, and I'm just watching it going, is this, wait, is that, is that Obi-Wan? Is that a young Darth Vader? What planet are we on? I mean, like literally, what planet are we on here? And sometimes it's hard to follow. If you know the whole story, you can understand the smaller stories. The Bible's like that, right? The Bible is just the same way where we can, if we know the big story, then every smaller story makes sense. And today I'm going to show you how that happens with the passage that we're going to look at today in Genesis 11. I want to start by asking you this question, though. Have you ever felt excluded? Have you ever felt like you were kind of left out? I think all of us have probably felt that along the way. A few months ago, I was a part of a, of a basketball game. It was kind of a celebrity basketball game. I'm not a celebrity, but it was a pastor's, and, and there were different guests and people, but it was a, a police officers and pastors were on different, I mean, same teams, but playing each other. It was really supporting you know, our police officers here in Dallas. And it was a great time. It's called Together We Ball. And so I, I got out there and what happened was we had captains and we lined up before the game um, and uh, we got out there on midcourt and the captains started to choose who's on their team. What, y'all? So I'm sorry, but okay, bald white guy. I'm not tall, but I'm slow. <laughs> and uh, so, so anyway, I, I'm, I, I'm standing there, and my mind went back to junior high, right? Because in North Carolina, that's how we did it. We'd play pickup games, and there'd be captains, and I want you, and I want you. And so we're picking, and, and I mean, I went like, I'm going, oh, man, I hope somebody picks me. I'm like, oh, man, I don't want to be the last guy standing. And I wasn't. <laughs> And, uh, and I was so glad to be included, but we all kind of know what it is to be excluded. We kind of know what it is to be on the outside looking in. Um, but what happens when we end up being the ones who are the exclusive ones? And maybe we don't even know it. And so today I'm going to challenge us through this story that's really a popular story. Many of us know this story. It's the story of the Tower of Babel, all right? So I'm going to use some still images along the way from this video we just saw to tie it to help teach you how, how do you look at one passage of Scripture, how does it play into the whole, and we're going to take a journey through the Bible. Um, because with each story within the Bible, uh, we, it makes sense when we understand the whole thing, all right? So in the first chapters of Genesis, we know that God creates this perfect place for Adam and Eve to live. And they have perfect fellowship with Him. We can't really imagine that, but we get taste of it because those of us who've received his grace, we now have a relationship with him. His spirit resides in us. We can pray and we sense his presence. We walk with him. We know his word. But this place was called Eden, right? And, and, and what we see then, as you just saw in the Bible, uh, you have these two spaces, two places, heaven and earth. Now, what we often do is we think they're totally separate. And a lot of people think that heaven is just something out there I'm going to get to. So when I receive Christ, I go into this holding pattern and uh, just kind of waiting to die and go to heaven. 
when that's not the way the Bible talks about heaven and earth. And right in creation, we see already that there's this heaven and earth interaction. God creates then, right, the, the, the earth, and we have God, heaven, interfacing with earth. It's overlapping here. And so in creation, we see the two. But Eden is where the two are united. Okay, so you see now God creates man and woman and they they find each other in perfect union with God. And this is what's important to understand. This is what you heard it. This is what the story of the Bible is all about. The uniting of heaven and earth. Okay, this is critical to understand if you want to know the whole story. But what we know is this. So heaven, right, is out there, and we saw it a moment ago, where it's eternal presence of God, all that kind of stuff. We know what earth looks like because we live here. We're, we're, we're sinful people in need of grace. So how can the two, how can heaven and earth be united is the big question after the fall, right? This is where, again, the temple comes into play, all right? Now I'm getting ahead of myself. But it comes into play as we look at this story in the book of Genesis. Look at Genesis chapter 11. And I want us to, I'm going to read Genesis uh, 11, 1 through 9. All right. Listen to this with me. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, that would be out of really Eden, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, come, let us, watch the language, us build for ourselves a city and tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down. Now, this is a play on words in the Hebrew. Uh, as if to say, the Lord condescended. He came down. He had to come down to see this little teeny city, this little tower they're built. The children of man are building. Even that's an that's a, a explicit way of saying these little people. Verse 6, the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they can do. I mean, he's, he's really saying there's no end to their craziness now and their sin. As they come together and nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them, keyword, dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth and they left off building the city. Therefore, it, its name was called Babel. All right, which ultimately would become, by the way, Babylon. We know a lot about Babylon, the evil kind of nation, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from, or, or from there, the Lord dispersed, there it is again, them over the face of all the earth. All right, now, so the key to understanding this whole passage is found in verse 4. You can see it there. It says, let us... Build, okay, make a city, but have a wall around it and a tower that reaches to heaven. This tower was, was a ziggurat, more, more, more likely than anything. And it was actually a spiritual kind of religious structure. Now, we see that as they're talking about, let's, 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 let's point to the heavens. Let's, let's bring the gods down to us. Let's, let's, let's get to heaven on our own. Let's build a way there. They're building it for themselves. Now, remember, God's entire purpose, watch this, the big story, all right, is is, is found in, in the first part of Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. You can see it there. God bless them. We're going to see this pattern. God blesses a person. He blesses a family, blesses a group. And then he says, hey, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Now, this is not simply, hey, go have a bunch of kids. All right. But now he's saying this is what's called the cultural mandate. Join me partnering with God for the flourishing of all humankind. We're co-creators with him, literally, as we have kids. But really, we, he's given us dominion and power, if you will, rule over the nations. And he says, go and display my glory to all people. Of course, then the fall takes place. Genesis 3. And we say, no, we'll call the shots, not you. And we're going to bring glory to ourselves. 
All right, we'll decide what's right and wrong. We're not going to follow your word, or your truth. And so then God, then we know what happens, right? First, we see sin with a man and a woman. Then we see sin into the family, Cain and Abel. We saw the Sethite line and the Cainite line ultimately ends up, we see sin go viral. We see what happens when sin becomes normalized in a society. And here, watch this. Here's where the story goes. You know that Noah, we looked at that last week, if you were here, God wipes out. Right. The, all the people except for Noah who found favor in his sight. And then there's a rebooting, a restart of the cultural mandate. Literally, he says, after the flood, Genesis 9, 7, be fruitful and multiply. Same language. Increase greatly on the earth. See this pattern. He says, go, 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 be, you know, multiply, spread my fame, my glory throughout the earth. Now, let me just say this. If you're reading this in context, Genesis 10, if you look back, you see that there were multiple, all right, multiple languages. Wait, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. There are many languages, many nations. And then you get to chapter 11, verse 1, and it says there's one. What's going on here? Again, you need to understand Hebrew literature. We've already seen this a couple of times throughout the creation, creation narrative in Genesis already. What happens is there's a summary of what's taking place, has taken place, and then the writer highlights, goes back and highlights certain aspects of the story, or he brings greater attention to what has already been said. That's what's going on here. He's highlighting now the story as if to say, this is how it happened. Because watch this, Genesis 10 is a fascinating study. It's called the Table of Nations, a fascinating study that I spent way too much time on this week because it explains how 70 nations became all the people groups of the world. Incredible Incredible stuff that you can track in, 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 in the history of the spread of mankind throughout just that one chapter. But before, here's what's important to understand. Before the dispersion takes place, the dispersion here in the story of Babel is not simply God's judgment. It's his, watch this, his plan all along. That's what I've wanted you to see here. Genesis 1, Genesis 9. We're going to see this is the story of God. This is what he's doing. And in Genesis 11.4, again, we see back to 11.4, this is a bold statement. You need to understand, because at first reading you, what's the deal? They're just building a tower. Why is God so angry? Because what we see here is sin in mob form. This is what it is. This is where people now, with a sinful vision of society, up against God's vision for society. So people groups can even enter into sinful pursuits. God's judgment will come upon them. It can happen in a family. It can happen, frankly, it can happen in a neighborhood. I mean, when you think about history, our minds quickly run to Nazi Germany. You think about that. But here's what we miss. If you know history, Germany was actually, you could argue, the pinnacle of Western civilization. Think about it. Think about the music, the arts. Think about science of all kinds, psychology, you know, all kinds of science, um, all kinds of innovation, technology coming out of Germany. Good grief. Theology, post-Reformation. And out of that culture then comes this, I mean, think about it. No German would actually, I mean, I guess some, but most Germans wouldn't just, I'm going to just go out and kill people. But under one flag, under one nation, together, they unite to kill over six million innocent Jews. How does that happen? And let's not forget, watch this, Hitler came to power through a democratic society and system. And we go, what? This is the story of Babel. It's why God says, there's no telling what they're going to do now. I mean, if they unite with a sinful vision of the world and society, watch the incredible possibilities for inconceivable sin. And so my point is this. This is an interesting study as to how societal um, you know, sin can take place and how the church can stand back and just watch it happen. I mean, a lot of us know of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, one believer who, was, who came up against it and said, this is wrong. He ends up being martyred with his underground seminary and, and coming after Hitler says, this is wrong, but a lot of people didn't. 
And I think we see this tension often in history, even in America. I mean, we got the, you know, America's original sin of racism and slavery. How does that happen? And preachers, even from the pulpit, just kind of saying it's okay, just advocating for it. Where do you and I do that in our lives today? Because we can become passive. So, so let's get our minds around this. What is the sin of, of Babel, really? Now, you would think, first of all, and this is how we read this story most often, well, immediately you think, well, it's pride. And that's true. Pride is the center of all sin. It's why I is the middle of pride. I in the middle of sin. It's what I want. Let us for ourselves. But here's the greater sin underneath it is uniformity. Uniformity. Not unity in diversity, okay? Unity without diversity is uniformity. Everybody has to be just like us. In fact, we're going to build a city. We're going to build a wall and we're going to build a tower and we're going to focus on ourselves. And so that leads to exclusion, right? That leads to an exclusion. Let us not be dispersed throughout the earth. We are not going to go and spread the fame of God. Instead, we're just going to turn inward Focus in on ourselves, a kind of centripetal force of sin that draws us in on ourselves. It can happen in your personal life. It's why all your friends look just like you. It can happen in your family. Say, nope, we're not, uh-uh, we're not sharing our stuff. They need, some, they need to stay for a night. Uh-uh, that's going to be a little awkward. No, we can't do that. But that person, uh, wow, you know, we, we've got a car. We've got two cars. They need a car. We could help them. They could have a car. No, 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 no. We, we got to protect ourselves. And this kind of protectionism, this inward focus, what we don't realize, it leads to an ambient anxiety in our culture. Always protecting, always guarding, always turning inward because sin by its very nature is self-destructive. And we do it when we, we act like Babel. This is not God's plan. It's contrary to his plan. That's what's going on here. So what is God's plan? Well, it's the opposite. Look how this works. First, the opposite of his plan is humility, not pride, but to be humble before God. God, everything I have is yours, and you've called me to be outwardly focused, not focused on myself. How can you be more outwardly focused in your life? Humility leads to diversity. Diversity, again, uniformity says everybody must be the same. Unity says oneness in diversity. You don't have to be just like me. And in the church, by the way, in your organization, but in the church, we're going to stick to what's core. The gospel is core. And everything outside of that that's non-core, we're going to say, hey, you know what? you got a different opinion about that. You've got an opinion. That's all good. We're going to receive and welcome others. And if you're a guest, you need to know this. This is a church of, it's a place of grace. And what our great desire is, is this. Inclusion, by its very nature, leads to diversity. Because everybody's welcome. And diversity then leads to a celebration of God's grace because it's proof that there's grace among us that really is a place of grace. So humility leads to diversity. Diversity leads to inclusion. You see how that plays out? And so we're going to make God's name great, not our own name. This is a contrast between a fallen community and a faith community. That's what this story really is all about, or at least as we look at the church. So we've got to wrestle, friends, with, re- with our personal relationships. I want you to consider, let the Spirit of God speak to you. How is it that you're being exclusive in your life in these days? How are you passing that on to your kids? You know, are, are you one to, I'm thinking of our students, as simple as, are you one that actually steps out and goes and finds that kid, you know, at lunch that has nobody to sit with? Are you too concerned? Oh, now, I, I, they may not, I might not be seen as cool if I go. Listen, Jesus was called a friend of sinners because he lived this way. He was always externally, outwardly focused. See, love, grace by its nature, is centrifugal in force. It's always outwardly seeking. That's why the church is always outwardly seeking. Not this protectionism. Kind of tribalism gone mad is what's going on here. That always leads to an implosion. The way of grace, the way of Jesus is better. And you need to know PCBC is a place of grace where everybody's welcome, everybody matters. Now watch, watch what happens here. Looking back at the big story, here it goes. We're going to look at this next week. In chapter 12, we see Abram. All right. And look at what it says. His first word to him is what? 
Hello? Thank you. It's go. His first word to him is go. You see, so we got the Tower of Babel, this, in, this, this exclusion, and really focused. He says, Abram, you're my boy. Go. And here's what's going to happen. Watch this. You see what it says? We're, we're gonna, I'm going I'm to send you out to away from your country, your, your kindred, your, your family. I mean, he's going out of his comfort zone. And he says, I'm going to take you to a place and I'm going to make from you. Watch this. He says, I'm going to make your name great. Oh, wait, that sounds a little bit like Babel. No, God's making his name great. He's not making his name great. God's going to make his name great. And then from him, because he's blessing him, he says, you're going to be a blessing to the nations. So he kicks restart again, in essence. He's found Abraham. He's blessed him. And he says, now go and you're going to accomplish my hopes and, 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 and purpose for the world. OK, now keep tracking with me. Watch what happens. We see a foreshadowing of this sacrifice to come in the story of, of Abraham and Isaac. So you can see there, there's this holy space right between heaven and earth. And now the location of God's presence, a man can enter into that presence if there is a sacrifice made. Right. And so what we see here, God's holy space, man's space is now what we're going to see is located over time. We see Moses. We see a tabernacle. If you read even this morning's reading in the Bible is that, that, that God's presence would show up in the tabernacle, in the tent of meeting. Moses would go in. God was. So the location of God's presence is in the temple. All right. So he shows up in the temple and namely in the holy of holies. Right. But watch what happens. I love this. Then comes the incarnation. Christ comes and now the location of his presence is in the person of Jesus. Look at what it says in John 1.14. You can see it there. For the word God became flesh and dwelt among us. Some of you know that word dwelt is literally again. It's, it's tabernacled. He tabernacled among us so much so that John says we've seen his glory. We've seen God in person. Now the presence of God resides in Jesus, who is the temple of God. His presence there in Christ. But Jesus, here it is again, he doesn't stay in the holy space. He doesn't stay in this, this hev, you know, kind of heavenly spot. He goes now out into the world. I'm bringing heaven into the world. And then John the Baptist makes this audacious claim. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So I don't know why John is so small, but he was a really little guy. And um, you know about Zacchaeus, but John was a teeny little guy because he's going to be less. And, and Jesus is going to be greater. I, get, I made that part up. But, uh, but he says, listen, he's now the Lamb of God. Not only the presence, the temple of God, it becomes the temple sacrifice of God and the ultimate sacrifice. Jesus has come to unite heaven and earth again. And here's what he does. He gives us church people, all right, his people. Um, he gives us the Great Commission in Matthew 28. It's a passage we know really well around here, right? Verse 18 through 20, he says, well, here it is again. Watch this. Go, go, therefore, into all the world. And tell others, be agents of my grace, my presence. Because what happens is, oh, I love this. He sends us out, but we still have a problem. Kind of getting ahead of ourselves here because we have a problem. We need a new heart. We're still separated from God. We want to speak our own particular language, our own race, our own nationality, my hood, my church. And let's just close in. I mean, it's why our connect groups, I was, I was in a connect group this morning briefly, a connect group that is, that is blowing up, growing, reaching all kinds of people. And I just want to bring a challenge to you and your connect groups and leaders, frankly. Is your connect group growing? Is it outwardly focused? And you might say, well, it's growing some or no, ours is not growing at all. But we're awesome. I mean, we're amazing. We love being together. And Jeff, you, I mean, we're loving, incredible. You might not be as awesome as you think you are. Not if, you're, not if you're not reaching out to other people. That's contrary to the plan of God. As a church, we should be reaching other people. And it's through you, each of us, inviting others to come and join us in your connect group, in worship. But watch what happens. We need a new heart. We need a change of heart. And so, bam, Acts 2, we see Pentecost. 
And now as the story keeps going, they're all together in one place, right? And then look at this. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire separated came to rest on them. And all of them were filled with the Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So now, watch this. The presence of God is located in the people of God. If you've received Christ, the triune God, you now have the Spirit of God in you. I have the Spirit of God Almighty in me to overcome sin, to live for him, to pray and to seek his face, to be a light, to be salt in the world. He gives us his presence, his spirit in us. This in Acts 2 is the opposite of Babel. It's the reverse of Babel. Now we're speaking in every language going out into the world. He will do so through his people. Again, the cultural mandate. Now, operative through the church, The spiritual heaven takes on earth and we go and share the gospel. And ultimately, here it is. As we go, heaven and earth are united. And then finally, forever, the new heaven and the new earth. That, my friends, is the big story of the Bible. And you and I have a place in it. And watch what happens. John gives us, it doesn't end there. He gives us a glimpse of heaven. And in Revelation 7, I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every tribe, every every nation, every tribe, people and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes made righteous, forgiven by the blood of the Lamb that we've celebrated today and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice. I want us to do this. Let's cry out in a loud voice. Let's say it together. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Praise be to God. He's inviting us into his big story and he's made it possible for you to have purpose in your life, to join him, bringing heaven to earth. And Christ's prayer is answered in us and through us that his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And he does it through us, filled with his Holy Spirit. Isn't it great to be a part of God's family? Amen? And if you're not, friend, I want us to pray together as we close our time because you can join in God's great plan. So let us all, let's bow our heads and close our eyes as we close our time together. And I'm burdened. My heart is heavy today. As much as I celebrate the fact that he's invited me and, and hundreds of us, thousands of us here in our church into his family. But I'm burdened that there are some who are here, no doubt in a crowd this size, who do not know our Savior. And so, friend, if you're here and you've never received Christ, you can't look back and say, there was a time, there was a moment when I realized that I was a sinner in need of grace, in need of forgiveness. If you can't remember, now's the time. That's why God brought you here today. He died on the cross for you. He gave his life for you so that he'd give you a new life. God is holy. You're sinful. And so Christ came as your sacrifice. He became the sacrificial lamb that would take away your sin. Receive his grace now. Say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I give you my life. And for the rest of us, as we close and head into the day and into the week ahead, let's give our hearts anew to him. Lord, Just say, Lord, help me to be inclusive. Help me to go into those dark spaces, relational challenges, into my place, my vocation, into the marketplace, into my school. Help me to step into those dark dark places as light, pockets of heaven that I can bring into the world. And Lord, I pray for our students in particular as they go, inviting their friends to come and join us. A disciple now in a couple weeks and just pray, Lord, you do a great thing among us. Change us, God. We're prone to focus in on ourselves. Let us be your people, fulfilling the cultural mandate, the Great Commission, this week, as we go. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.